welcome and hello to everybody. Arise. It is so good to see all of your faces. To those of you that are online, I know that I can't see your beautiful faces, but welcome. And if it's your first time, we love visitors. We really do. We've got a whole lot of ladies here in table view. And um, we've got a whole bunch of ladies at our different venue, Millie's, Milnerton venue, with the city congregation ladies and the Millie's ladies there. Hello, everyone. It's nice to see you. <laughs> um, well, I can't really see you. You can see me. But anyway, um, it is so good to be together. It's always an honor and a privilege for me to be able to share with you tonight. And um, I never want to take it for granted. And it's a huge blessing. It really is a huge honor. I'm not sure if they're able to get that table for me at all. Maybe... Okay, all right. Well, ladies, isn't it amazing that um, we have a bit of warm weather? Aren't you, aren't you excited to have warm weather after that long, horrible, cold winter? I don't know about you, but I'm a summer girl. I love summer. Give me slops and uh, a little dress. And, you know, I hate winter. I, I'm sorry. I'm not a winter girl. I don't enjoy putting on all those layers upon layers upon layers. You know, you've got the, the, the leggings under your, your jeans and you've got the vests and you've got the, I mean, I feel the cold terribly. It goes right through me. Yeah. And then you, you've got to put the beanies and the scarves and the boot, you know, the socks and the boots. And oh my goodness, by the time you leave home, it's like, you know, Mitchell and man, you can hardly move. It's terrible. Um, but with summer, it's just so easy. You just, you know, put on a pair of slops and a dress and off you go. Quick, simple, easy. I love it. But um, spring is in the air and summer is coming. And um, spring is a season where people also work hard at getting their, their bodies back in shape, right? After a long, long, cold winter and after all those lockdown regulations, I don't know about you, I'll be the first one to admit uh, a lot of extra snacking, a lot of uh, comfort eating in the lockdown. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we work hard at getting our bodies back, you know, ready for the beach, ready. I don't know about you, I love the beach. So um, at the moment, I need a new costume. My costume is looking really tattered. You know, when it starts like fraying and it's really bad. And my husband, it's just a bit of a sore point in our house because <laughs> I have to drag my husband. Oh, thank you. There we go. Thank you. Okay, I have to drag my husband shopping with me. He has to like check all the costumes out, you know, and it takes hours and hours. And I haven't had much luck with finding the right costume. So after all those, that time, I don't buy anything. And then my husband's like, what? <laughs> you know, so he gets so irritated. So he has a bit of a nervous twitch every time I say, I need a new costume for summer. Anyway, I don't know why I'm telling you that, but... Um, yeah, we, we, you know, we work hard at getting our bodies back into shape. We go to hit classes. We go to, you know, we do those eight-week fitness plans, four weeks fitness plans, or next thing it's going to be a one-week or a three-day. Wouldn't that be amazing? Come on, come on. Um, but we work really hard at getting back into shape and bouncing back for summer. And I have a very, I just want to take a moment just to honor a very dear friend of mine, Louise. She was hosting you, one of the ladies hosting you. Just stand up, Louise. Not I'm talking about uh, losing weight, but honestly, my friends, you've done so well. This lady has lost over 33 kilograms in three years. And let me tell you, she is looking gorgeous. She has put so much dedication, so much hard work into getting her body back into shape. And um, it takes a lot of dedication. It takes the right eating, right exercise. And um, yeah, it takes a lot of work. And what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that to get anything back into shape, not just our bodies, is no easy task, right? You think about restoring old furniture that needs to get back in shape and needs to kind of be restored. It takes a lot of time. If you want to revamp your houses, you want to rest, you know, redo your kitchen or whatever it is, it takes a lot of dedication, a lot of time. It's no easy task. Hedges need to be cut back. Um, oh, sorry. Hedges need to be cut back. Um, gardens trimmed. You know, paint starts peeling off the walls, and after time and weath being weathered, you've got to paint it and fill in all the cracks and all of that. But it takes a lot of a lot of effort. I'm just going to have a sip of water, if you don't mind. But what I want to share tonight is that we can so often get bent out of shape, especially after difficult, tough times, winter seasons, in a sense, hey, and we all go through it, you know, 
And um, even after this tough, tough season of COVID, um, perhaps your marriage is out of shape. Perhaps you've taken strain with the kids being at home more and your husband's being at home, working from home, the two of you, or maybe there's the, your finances are bent out of shape because you've lost your job or you've taken major pay cuts or perhaps your family's out of shape because you might have lost loved ones to um, COVID. But maybe, maybe you're sitting here tonight and COVID actually hasn't been that bad for you as it has for others. Maybe it's been a whole bunch of difficult trials and challenges over the years. And I just want to say that in all of these things, if we don't make sure that we get back into shape, we will carry on bent out of shape. And, if, and it's okay to be bent out of shape for a while because it's normal, but we don't want it to lead to a lifetime of deformity, right? None of us want to get there. None of us want to be like that. And I just found it really interesting that, I don't know why my throat's so dry, but anyway, I found it really interesting that the word of the year for 2021, guess what it is? Resilience. Resilience. That's on your cards there. But um, I think it's just such an apt word for 2021. Resilient. When I looked up the definitions, it says this, the capacity to recover quickly or bounce back from difficulties or the ability of an object to bounce back into shape. And I just think words can so often define our years, you know? They have such power. I don't know about you if you ever come up with a word for the year, or I don't know if that's your vibe, but um, the words can define our years. I often think about even slang words, like, okay, I'm going to give away my age here, but going back to the 90s, um, (laughs) we would have slang words like lank and cool and kiff and, you know, boffin. You're such a boff. I don't know if I'm making sense to anyone here. I'm really giving away my age. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit older. <clears throat> and then my 12-year-old, you know, the words that he uses for his years are, I'm just going to look at this. I need to get this right. Bussin respectfully means cool. Bussin re- respectfully. Um, this burger slaps. It's so, it's so tasty. It's yummy. It's burger slaps. And um, my gar, my gar. How's it my gar? You know, it's my gar. Dope. This is so dope. I don't know. You know, I'm trying. I'm trying to understand him. It's hard. It's hard, but getting back to the word for 2021, resilient, I think it's very, very apt. You know, one has to have some sort of resilience coming out of a pandemic, right? And uh, I just, I saw a study in America, they found that nearly eight, um, eight and 10 adults say that the pandemic is a major source of stress and suspected overdoses went up to 42%. That is a lot, girls, 42%. And according to a recent study, 41% of Americans have struggled with mental health issues like anxiety, depression, or substance abuse related to the pandemic. And that's just COVID. I mean, it's crazy. Given the challenges of 2020, it's hard not to see the urgent need for resilience. Um, Paul, the apostle, is probably the best example of someone who's resilient with everything that he'd been through. And he pens it down really beautifully in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8. And that's the scripture that's on your cards there because I want you to remember this. It says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. But you see, the real power in this is that in verse 7, just before that, it says this, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. You see, you can only be verse 8 if you have verse 7. You can only be not crushed, not in despair, not abandoned, not destroyed because you have the power of God inside of you. We are the jars of clay and we have His power inside of us, right? Right? And God is calling us, ladies, girls, He's calling us to be resilient, not in our own strength, no ways. It'll only get you that far. He's calling us to bounce back after the hard knocks in life. And I just, tonight I want to share a story. I'm just checking the time, okay, 10 to 8. All right, sorry, I've got a a time limit, but I'm just making notes. Okay, Um, back to what I was sharing. Yeah, I want to share a story tonight from the Old Testament And it's about a lady named Hannah. And I think a lot of you might know the story, but I just think she's the most incredible, resilient woman. She was faced with so much adversity. 
And I think it's just going to help us tonight. And I've, so the title of my preach is Bouncing Back. And if you want to write that in the comments um, to all the ladies online, just write there, Bouncing Back, Bouncing Back. And just a little background to the story. Um, uh, Alcana was married to Hannah. So Hannah's husband was Alcana, um, but he was also married to Panina. I know, it's a little controversial. We are talking Old Testament if you've got any questions, you can come talk to me afterwards, okay? Um, <laughs> but yeah, so Panina had lots of children. She had many, many kids, but Hannah had no children. Uh, it says God closed her womb. And in those days, you have to understand, to be a woman who couldn't bear children, it was almost like there was a big stigma attached to you. There was a big disgrace, because in those days, um, your whole sense of worth, your whole sense of value, and your whole identity was wrapped in the fact that you are bearing children and having children. And uh, you can imagine Hannah's shame and guilt as she had to carry this thing year after year after year after year. She had every reason to be bent out of shape, right? She had every reason. And this was Hannah's affliction, yet it says Alcano, her husband, loved her so dearly. And um, we'll read a little bit later, but he would make sure that everybody around her and herself, that she knew that she was loved so dearly. And um, Alcana and his family went up from his town. What they did in those days was like, I think it was about three times a year, they would go up to the temple, it would be a big, big feast, and they would worship, and they would sacrifice and worship, and this was their quite kind of worship to God, you know. And um, they would do that three times a year. And I want us to just turn to 1 Samuel 1. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Samuel 1 from verse 4. And I think the scripture is going to come up behind me. Yeah, okay. Whenever the day came, okay, that's not right. I'm not sure. But anyway, okay. Whenever the day came for Alcana to sacrifice, he would give portions of meat to his wife Panina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. And this went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. And girls, I just want to share three points out of the story um, that we can learn from Hannah about bouncing back. And the first point is bounce back from barrenness. Bounce back from barrenness. And if you want to write that in the comments, bounce back from barrenness. And um, how do we bounce back from barrenness in our lives? And I don't just mean barren as in not being able to have children, although, yes, we trust God for miracles and we trust God to bring life. And, you know, we've seen miracles. I've had my own miracle of God opening up my womb. I struggled to pull pregnant. But not just being barren in a sense of not having children, but being barren in the terms of not having life. In certain areas in your life, perhaps it's your marriage or your relationship with your daughter or um, your, your workspace, there's no life, there's no fruit, there's no, it seems dead. And um, there have been many personal seasons in my own life where, of barrenness. Like I mentioned to you, I couldn't fall pregnant, I, I would see all my friends fall, uh, falling pregnant around me, we'd pray for people that fall pregnant, um, and they, my, my womb was, it was, it was dead. And then... There was a journey, and still is a journey, of my health journey and my chronic pain journey, which has been going on for years. I'm a lot better, but there was years and of barrenness where I just couldn't do anything. I couldn't do what I normally did, you know. I, I had to, there were times where I had to lie flat on my back. I had to uh, ask friends to help me with the kids and lift kids, and, you know, I, I couldn't pick up Daniel, my youngest child. I had to sit down. I couldn't carry him. Um, I wasn't able to travel with my husband and minister, and I, there was a sense of barrenness in that time. A season of, of barrenness, even in my calling years ago, not now, but years ago where I almost just didn't know what I was called to. I knew my husband was called to lead a church. I wasn't quite sure about me, and God, if you called me to ministry, and thank goodness God is, <laughs> you know, he's confirmed that call, and there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever. I know I'm meant to be here, but um, there was some barrenness in my life. And maybe there's barrenness in your marriage. Maybe it seems dry and desolate. Maybe there's not much joy. Maybe you're on the brink of divorce even. I don't know. Perhaps there's barrenness in your finances and you're struggling to make ends meet. But I just want to look at how Hannah bounces back from her barrenness. And it says in 1 Samuel um, 1, 7 to 8, she wept and would not eat. 
her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? And I'm sorry, I had to laugh at this because isn't that just like men, hey? They really think they're the answer to all our problems, right? I'm just like, yo, could you get, you know? Really, I love you, Mark, if you're watching. <laughs> I really do. Really good. Really good. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's just part of their calling. You know, they're coming to save the day, and I'm here, and, you know, I'm the answer to all your... Anyway, it doesn't matter. Let's not go down that road. But have. I already have, yeah. <laughs> it looks as though Elkanah's actually being insensitive to his wife. When I first read this, I'm like, come on, jeez, you know, this woman's struggling. And, um, but he's actually, what he's doing is he, he's lovingly rebuking and reproving her. And um, there's nothing wrong with grieving and mourning and all of that. We need to do those things. But this went on year after year after year. And she almost allowed her circumstance to, to blur her vision of God and to overwhelm her. And she failed to see God and, and come to Him and ask Him. And so He reminds her almost in a sense. And He says, come on, you know, um, why are you crying? And this is how she comes back and bounces back from a barrenness. She listens to his rebuke. She listens to him. When we let difficulties consume us more than God's love for us, and it blurs our vision, he will lovingly and gently rebuke us at times. He really will. In the same way that Elkanah reproved Hannah. And I just want to say, girls, um, none of us like the word discipline, hey? <laughs> Correction and rebuke is actually really, it's always done in love, and it's really good for us. Because this is what's going to help us grow. This is what's going to help us bounce back. I've had so many people, you know, correct me and rebuke me. I remember my life group leader at one stage, this was years ago, I was going out with Mark. And um, he'd asked us to lead a life group. And I was just like, oh, Mark, you know, he doesn't read his Bible enough. No, we can't, you know. And um, he, he actually said to me, what did he say? He said, get off your high horse, Candice. Get off your spiritual high horse. And I was like, oh, okay. I'm so offended, but it actually made me think, actually, yes, I can be quite spiritually arrogant. It's not good, you know? So Hebrews 12, 6 and 11 says this, for the Lord disciplines and corrects those whom he loves. Those whom he loves. For the time being, no correction brings joy, but seems painful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, listen to this, afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit, the life of righteousness, and if we want to be fruitful and bounce back from barrenness, whatever that is in your life tonight, we need to um, come under the Word of God. We need to come under even those that might be leading us or friends, trusted friends that are saying, hey, what about this, you know, come on, like, you know, it's, we all love to be encouraged and taught, but none of us really like to be corrected, but it's actually good for us. I'm just having another sip. It's part of being in community, ladies. It's good for us. We, you know, iron sharpens iron. We need each other. We've all got blind spots. We need our good friends and people in a community to say, hey, you know, have you thought about this? What about that? And you need to just, you know. Um, so that's what she does. She lists her, she, to bounce back from her barrenness, she, she listens to rebuke and she, yeah, she listens to rebuke. And then number two, she prays and she presses into God. Verse 10 and 11 says this, In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him, the, give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And I just want to say, she really sought God after her husband's rebuke. She pressed into God and she prayed with deep anguish. And I believe her prayers were honest. I think God's not scared of our mess. I've learned that, you know, I, I, when I was struggling with back pain, like so bad, I, I, I was so broken and I was almost like I had to learn how to just lament before God and be honest with Him. And I, I remember being so angry and so disappointed and I, I don't think God's scared of that. He wants our whole hearts. He wants us to come before Him and lament. Uh, and, and, you know, the Psalms are filled with passionate expressions of sorrow and disappointment and grief. And, you know, um, David, you know, there's, it's depressed, but it never really ends there. It never ends there, right? That's what we've got to remember. But um, so we need to get honest before God. And um, 
Then she prayed, not generally, but she prayed specifically. She actually asked God, Lord, I want a son. I want a son. And I think we need to come to God with boldness. And we've got to ask him. It's Philippians says, um, bring your requests. Uh, what does it say? Present your requests to God. Actually, we've got requests. We've got to actually come before his throne of grace with boldness. That's what the word says. And actually ask him for things. You have not because you ask not. We've got to ask, girls. We've got to ask specifically. And um, I'm reminded of um, an Old Testament uh, prophet, Ezekiel. And some of you might know the story. But um, God gives him a vision of a valley of dry bones, like this massive valley of dry bones. And it's just, it's dead. And God asks him, can these bones live? Can these bones live? And... um, and he says to him, prophesy to these bones. And he says this, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath into you and you will come to life. And girls, I'm sorry, but we've got to get a little bit more bold. And we've got to start declaring God's promises, start declaring his word over the barrenness in our lives. We've got to come to him with boldness. We've got to come to him honestly. And we've got to actually just present our requests and prophesy, prophesy into your marriage prophesy into your workspace, prophesy into that strained relationship with your father, or that strained relationship with your son or daughter, prophesy the word of God into these things. And he is the one who brings life. Being resilient is seeking God and believing and declaring his word. So secondly, um, Hannah also battled with much adversity. She, the secondly, my, my point is bounce back from adversity. Bounce back from adversity. Write it in the comments. Bounce back from adversity. 1 Samuel 1, 6 to 7. Let's read. It says this. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. And let's just call her <clears throat> provoking Panina, right? <laughs> provoking Panina. Come on. You know, she's like one that's just, just kind of gets you in there and just irritates you. And, you know, she, I'm almost, okay, this might sound a little weird, but it's like, <laughs> um, she was mean. She was jealous of Hannah. She was so insolent. It was like watching the housewives of Israel. Can I say that? <laughs> because, come on. I mean, I've watched some of those things. They are so scary. Those women are so scary. I just watch it because I cannot believe how horrible. You know, the housewife of New York or whatever. I don't know. I've just watched. I haven't watched a lot. But um, the housewives of Israel, you know, this is provoking Panina as being so mean. And there's a whole lot of backstabbing and jealousy and bad mouthing going on. And she would provoke and irritate her year after year. And, you know, I can just imagine having to prepare for the feast each year and having this woman, like, provoking you. And it kind of reminds me of those family events, you know. You go to the yearly Christmas dinners and the, you know, the, um, I don't know, Easter lunches or whatever. But there's always maybe, I'm not saying it's like this for everyone. I'm just, I'm using my imagination. But maybe there's that one um, Auntie Ellie or Cousin Cassidy or whatever that just, you know, knows your faults and knows your failures and knows your, you know, you haven't done this and you haven't done that. And she just provokes you each year. It's like that, you know, same, same thing, just different year. But uh, who is provoking you? Maybe it's a work colleague. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's their words. Perhaps it's their actions. It goes straight to the heart and it hurts. Maybe it's not a person. Maybe for you sitting here tonight, it's an affliction. It's an illness. Perhaps it's a physical illness, an emotional illness, a mental illness that you have been battling year after year after year. And um, Paul speaks about a thorn in his side, thorn in his side. And and he asks God, God, take this away from me. And it's it's painful and it's sore. And and some of the the people say it's, I don't know, it's it's either an illness or um, it was some bad relationship or something. But it was this thing that wouldn't leave his side. It was just there nagging him and provoking him every time. And he asked God, Lord, take it away three times. And God's answer to him was this. He said, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in your weakness. So girls, listen to that word tonight. My power, God's power, is perfected in your weaknesses. You can boast 
about your weaknesses. You can boast about your affliction. You can, you know, all we got to do is actually bring it to him and trust him, submit it to him. And we don't need to put on a brave face and, you know, um, uh, pretend like, you know, we've got this and, you know, no, just be honest with this and give it to God and, and trust him to, to give you grace and power to, you know, get through those Christmas dinners and, yeah, anyway, being resilient in adversity or affliction isn't hiding our weakness and putting on a brave face. It's relying on, it's not relying on ourselves, it's relying on God and surrendering to Him. So let's bounce back from adversity in our lives by not uh, um, reacting, uh, that's one thing I forgot to mention, Panina, sorry, Hannah, she never reacted to Panina. I mean, she could have, you know, there was no cat fight, there was no pulling of hair, or, but she never reacted. She carried on with her devotions to God year after year. She carried on. And you know what, girls, sometimes we need to control our tongues. And I think, I'm including myself here, I think we, as women, we're so quick with our mouths, we're so quick with our tongues, and it's, it has the power of life or death. And I think we've got to learn how to tame our tongues, and I think we've got to learn when to speak and when not to speak. Sometimes there's, it's so powerful not speaking. And um, yeah, and this is just what I wanted to say. Bouncing back from adversity is not reacting. It's continuing our devotions, carrying on with what God's called us to, and receiving his grace and power with our weaknesses as we surrender to him. But um, <clears throat> Hannah not only had to bounce back from barrenness and bounce back from adversity from Panina, but uh, oh, that name is very funny, Panina. But anyway... <laughs> Sorry, just putting it in there. Number three, she had to bounce back from criticism. She had to bounce back from criticism. And we're going to read it now. To add vinegar to her wound, she had to deal with a priest, Eli, who criticized her and falsely judged her and accused her. Let's read from verse 12. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. And the very thing that she was pressing into and doing right and praying and seeking God was the very thing that was criticized. And maybe you've been wrongly accused here tonight. Maybe... Um, You've been criticized harshly. Perhaps people have labeled you from things you might have done in your past, but God has restored you and you've moved on and you've allowed God to heal you, but those labels, they haven't moved on. The people, what they think. Maybe it's the enemy lying to you like a thousand times a day because he is the father of lies. He is the liar, the deceiver, and he does that to all of us. He says things like, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not pretty enough. You know, and this goes on and on in our heads. But I want to encourage you tonight with a scripture. And it's Romans 8, 1 and 33. There is now no condemnation. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. So people can criticize, the world can judge, and Satan can say a million lies to us a million times a day. But if you are in Christ and you are obedient and following his ways, then let me tell you, they can judge all they like. God justifies. And let me tell you another thing. We are only justified by the blood of Jesus, by his perfect sacrifice for us. We are all sinners. We're all the same. And God has justified us and he has given his blood and his body for us. That's the only thing. That's the only thing that makes us stand righteous before God. And we have to be secure in that, girls. We have to be secure in that. Our security comes from being in Him, a daughter of God, sisters in Christ. Our security doesn't come from people's opinions of us, of, you know, or how pretty we are, or how many likes we get, or um, how many views we get, or whatever it is. No, it's being in Him. I remember um, just recently, well, not recently, a couple of, yeah, I don't know, months ago, um, we were... As a church, we were dragged into a political storm, if you want to call it that. Uh, there were false accusations that related to the COVID um, fund um, endeavors. And 
just hours of personal sacrifice, and, and I know of so many people that served and helped in that, that, whole, um, that whole fund, but um, they falsely accused us, and we did nothing wrong, and uh, we just got into this political storm, and we didn't fight back. It was in the news and, and all of that, but, you know, we didn't fight back. All we did was give an accurate account to the, the news, whatever, the journalists. We gave an accurate account of what happened, and we trusted in God to fight for us. We trusted that God would actually, you know, it says in Psalm 9 verse 4, for you have upheld my right and my cause, sitting enthroned as righteous judge. He's upholding your right, and he's upholding your cause. And God did come through. Sorry. How does Hannah bounce back from Eli's, uh, from the priest's criticism? Again, she doesn't react. The, the, you know, she doesn't pull the, mm, 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 don't you dare, don't you dare, you know, no, 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 she doesn't do that. I was practicing that. <laughs> um, she, but she, uh, she responds, and she responds humbly by denying the charge and giving an accurate account of what she was actually doing. I was pouring out my heart, you know, in anguish, and, um, and she speaks to him with respect. She says, my Lord, and I think, you know, we can still respect those. We have to. They criticize us. Love our enemies, you know. And um, by res- listen to this. By responding well to Eli, his whole demeanor changes and the whole story changes. Let's, let's read from verse 17. Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. Go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. When we respond well to criticism... I believe God will bless us. I really do. I really do. You want God to bless you? Stop reacting. Stop reacting. And can I even just take a moment and say, stop reacting on Facebook. You don't need to self-justify. You really don't. God justifies you. He's fighting your cause. You really, really don't. Leave it in God's hands. He is the one who fights for you. We need to learn resilience in the accusations. Let's bounce back from criticism by speaking what's true and letting God fight for us. So Hannah bounced back from barrenness. She bounced back from adversity and she bounced back from criticism. And now she bounced back to full recovery. That's my last point, point number four. Bounce back to full recovery. Bounce back to full recovery. In verse 18, it says this. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went away and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshipped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. So she received Eli's blessing in faith. See, her whole demeanor changed as well. She received his blessing in faith, and um, she believed God would do a miracle. And three things happened after this encounter, right? She ate. She bounced back physically. She wasn't sad. She bounced back emotionally. And she worshipped. She bounced back spiritually. And I think God wants to restore us in every area. He wants us to bounce back fully to, to full recovery. We serve a God who restores. We serve a God who heals. We serve a God who refreshes us. You know, we need to allow ourselves time to recover. And um, I'm, I'm often reminded of those athletes that drink those recovery drinks. And, um, you know, they, their bodies need to replenish after a really hard, tough race. And it's the same for us. After much trauma, after hectic times and difficulties in our lives. We've got to allow ourselves time to recover. I remember doing ballet uh, and, you know, on our points and point shoes and, you know, our toes would get so bloodied and so um, uh, blistered and stuff. And I had to allow my toes to soak in meths, to dry the skin so that I could dance again. And it's the same for us. God wants us to recover. And sometimes we need to recover physically, whether it's needing, very simply, maybe you just need sleep. Maybe you need time out. Maybe you need good, healthy food. <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's that simple. Sometimes we need to recover emotionally or mentally. And maybe that's actually booking a counselor or a therapist or phoning a friend and saying, can we actually just have a coffee and can we chat? Perhaps it's re- you need time to recover spiritually. You need time for God's word and his worship to just wash over you and refresh you and build you up again. And Psalm 23 says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. God restores us. And sometimes he'll make you lie down. If you're not making time to lie down, I've learned this thing. 
He will, he will make you lie down. He will make you stop. And um, Hannah was fully restored even before receiving her miracle. Isn't that amazing? This was before she received her miracle, her son. She was restored because she trusted God and she pressed into him. And um, Hannah bounced back to full recovery. But I believe being resilient is not only about bouncing back, but about bouncing forward. Bouncing forward into the promises that God has for us. In um, verse 19 and 20, it says, Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord... Oh, sorry. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. Hannah received her miracle. She, she was fruitful, and I believe God wants us all to be fruitful, to thrive in our trials, within our trials and after our trials. Romans 5, 3 to 5 says this, we, we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Pro, perseverance produces character. Character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. You know, I'd love to say it's the easy times that grow us, but it's not. It's the difficult times, you know, and we can allow those difficult times to help us grow. We need to be resilient going forward, girls. Why? Why do we need to be resilient going forward? Because we are going to be faced with many, many more trials in our lifetime. Jesus says you are going to be, you will, you will have trouble in this world. And I'm telling you now, younger girls, if you haven't come across any trials, I promise you now it's going to come. And God wants us to be resilient, strong in Him, strong in Him. And um, I think also the call of God demands us to be resilient because He's called us to greater things. He hasn't called us to walk bent out of shape for years and years, to walk broken and bruised. And God is a God who heals and restores, and He wants to use you, table view ladies, ladies online, ma'am. He wants to use you. He wants to use you, Millies and city ladies, to reach out to a broken and bruised and lost world. This is why it's not only for ourselves, ladies. This is for a lost and broken world. Come on. And um, I just want to end with the same scripture that I started with, and it's on your cards. Let's just read it again. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We are the jars of clay. We are the jars of clay. Jesus is the potter. We are the clay. Clay is so easily, can be so easily molded and shaped, and Jesus is always fixing and molding and shaping our lives. Allow Him to mold you. Allow Him. And... Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I just want to say that, you know, Jesus is always fixing our shapes. And whether it's the woman who was bleeding for 12 years and he healed her, whether it's the woman who was caught in adultery, he forgives her and he heals her, whether it's a lame man that couldn't walk and with one word he can walk and he's, he's you know, there's a miracle and, and he's restored. Jesus is always about fixing our shapes. And, um, and sometimes he says, go and sin no more. And I just I have to say this, sometimes our sin bends us out of shape. It's not just the hard knocks of life. It's not just the difficulties we face. But it's our sin that sometimes, you know, it's unforgiveness, insecurity, pride, jealousy. We all have it, shame, guilt. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. That's your first step. If there's one thing you need to remember tonight, come to Jesus. He is your healer. He is your restorer. He is the one who breathes life. Resilience is found in Jesus.